Hello and welcome back to The Effect. Now we're start, finally starting on chapter 17, which uh, for some of you picking up a causal inference book based on what you might have heard about the field before, you might be surprised that this was not, in fact, chapter one, because uh, we are finally getting to the place uh, where we are having sort of research designs that we might expect to be able to apply in a bunch of different cases. And we did a bit of that with fixed effects, uh, but it's actually pretty rare that people think that fixed effects can by itself, just by itself, identify a causal effect of interest. Uh, we've also talked about this with controlling for variables, but again, that's difficult. You got to figure out the whole causal diagram. Uh, we're sort of heading into what are called canned designs, uh, which are sort of structures that if your particular setting applies to them, uh, then you can expect to be able to get a causal effect of interest, again, assuming that the, uh, the setting applies. So we're going to start with the very, 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 very simplest of these, which is event studies. Uh, now, what I mean by event studies uh, is that we have a event. Something happened at a particular period of time, and we have a time before that happened, and we also have a time after that happened. And in order to find the effect of what happened, we will compare what came after to what came before, and we will see what changed. That's it. That is what event studies are, at least in the lingo that I'm talking about. Um, and that's why they're so simple, right? No, you don't need any sort of special training to sort of figure out effects to event studies. You've probably done a couple on your own without ever having done it before uh, or heard about it, uh, or maybe even heard the term or used statistics or anything, you know, dogs will do an event study. Uh, if they, if they go to you and they whine and they get some food and then they are fed, they will learn that whining causes them to get fed. That is a form of event study. Very, very simple. Now, that said, just because they're simple doesn't mean that it always works. Like I said, the actual setting needs to apply uh, in the case that you're doing, and you need to do it correctly, which is what this chapter is actually about. Uh, now, before we get too far into it, a quick note on some terminology and lingo. Uh, because this is such a simple design, uh, there are a bunch of different names that this design goes by. Uh, you might hear statistical process control, you might hear interrupted time series, um, you might hear before and after comparison, you might hear case control is sometimes used to refer to something like this, although usually that means something else entirely. Um, and in addition to having different names for the same thing, we also use the same term to refer to different things. Uh, the word event study means different things in different contexts. Uh, if you're an economist, you might be more familiar with the term event study referring to a case where you have uh, many different events occurring to different people at different times, uh, and maybe you also have some sort of control group happening. Uh, whereas the, the case that I'm talking about here, I'm using the term sort of as it's more used in finance, uh, which is where you have a single event that happens at a single time, and we are looking at the before versus after. With that out of the way, like I said, this is a very simple design. We're simply comparing before to after, and there are, of course, some details surrounding that, but that's the idea, uh, which leads us to this very simple causal diagram, uh, and it reflects what is going on here. We have some sort of treatment we want to know the effect of on the outcome, um, and that treatment goes into effect at a particular time. So you're either before the time and you're not treated, or you are after the time, uh, the event time, and then you are treated, right? And the entirety of whether you are treated or not is based on whether you are before or after that time period. Uh, now, of course, time changes. Uh, so, you, you know, the, the, you can imagine a time variable by itself affecting whether you are currently before or after the event occurring. Uh, and then also things might just be changing over time in general. So we have an arrow from time to the outcome. So we have a clear pathway that we are trying to identify here. We really want that arrow from the treatment to the outcome. Uh, and we have a single back door to worry about, and that back door goes through uh, time. And so simple enough, we can measure time. So why don't we just control for time and fix our backdoor problem, identify the causal effect of interest. Well, we can't do that. And the reason we can't do that is because time is just so darn good at determining whether we are treated or not. Remember, the event what happened at a particular period of time any period before that event, it was not you were not being treated, and any period after, you were. So what happens if we try to close the back door through time by simply controlling for time? We're going to predict the level of treatment before the, uh, the treatment went into effect, which is zero, like nobody was treated before the effect. And we're going to predict the level of treatment after the, the treatment went into effect, which is 100%. So everyone got treated. Once we subtract those out, there's no difference in treatment to compare. We've, so we've gotten rid of all the variation in treatment, which means that there's nothing left to study. So we can't just control for time in order to close that back door. We need to do something a at least a little bit more clever. And there are a bunch of different ways that we can do this, but the general idea is this. We're going to use something about the before treatment period to make a prediction about what the post-treatment period would have been like. 
Uh, so we use information that we have to make a prediction about how things would have turned out. Then we will see how things did actually turn out, and we will see whether that is higher or lower or the same as what we predicted to happen. If it turns out the actual observation is higher than we would have predicted, uh, then we have a positive treatment effect. If it's lower than we would have predicted, we have a negative treatment effect. If it's exactly the same as what we would have predicted, we have zero treatment effect. That's the general idea. Now this is different from just controlling for time uh, because I am not removing all the variation in treatment. Rather, I am using my pre-treatment data to get a prediction about what this things would have looked like over here in the post-treatment period. Uh, and that's the basis on which I'm making my comparison. Now, if you look at the data in these graphs, what do you see? Uh, in the first graph over there, you can see that, you know, we have a, a time series. We have a time, a time series of the same, same value being measured many different points in time. And it sort of jumps up and down and moves around, um, but there's no real trend to it, right? It seems like it's flat as you go along on that left graph there. Now then, the treatment happens, right? At some point in time, the treatment goes into effect. What would we have expected to occur if the treatment had not happened? Well, we didn't really see any sort of trend before, so we probably would have expected that to continue. Uh, so we would predict, probably, that if nothing had happened, if the treatment had not occurred, then that flat little trend line would have continued being flat afterwards. But what do we see instead? We see that at the point of treatment, the time series jumps up, uh, and then it sort of fades back down. So from this, you can immediately see what we would expect the treatment effect to be. Uh, it looks like we have a very positive treatment effect right at the period where treatment goes into effect, and then it seems to fade out and fade back towards uh, what we would have expected to see anyway over time. We can see a similar thing on the right graph. What do we see here? Uh, well, here's, here we see an upward trend over time. Uh, again, there's jumps up and down every, from day to day, um, but uh, you can also clearly see that things are climbing over time. We would have expected that climb to continue after the treatment uh, went into effect. So we see the treatment go into effect at a particular time, uh, and we expect that if the treatment had not occurred, that trend we saw probably would have continued going along its merry way. What do we see instead? We see that the actual outcome drops, which does not go along with the trend that we were seeing before, uh, suggesting that now we have a negative treatment effect that we are getting. In both cases, we're using we're using what we saw before the treatment to make a prediction in the, the, the light color prediction there about what would have happened after the treatment, and we are comparing to that. We're comparing what we see to a counterfactual prediction. And that's the basic idea uh, for how event studies work. So doing this, trying to use the, the data that we see in the before period to predict the after period and then comparing to that is a way of trying to close that back door. And there are a bunch of different ways that we can do it. Uh, and they all have to do with this question of how exactly is the best way to make that prediction in order to close that back door. And it has to do with what you expect would have happened over time if indeed the treatment had not occurred. So there are three main approaches that we can take to trying to make that prediction and thus close the back door. And they, all, and they all have to do with the question of, well, you know, how do we think things would have tried to evolve if indeed nothing had happened? So the first approach we can take is to simply ignore the problem, pretend we do not have a time back door. Uh, and in this case, you are simply comparing the after outcomes to the before outcomes and you're seeing whether they went up or down. If things are better now than they were before, positive effect. If things are worse now than they were before, negative effect, right? Easy. You might think, well, you didn't close the back door. You just sort of assumed there wasn't one. That surely won't work. Well, a lot of the time it won't, but also sometimes it will. Uh, maybe you're in a situation where you're pretty confident that there's nothing that would have changed from before to after. If you look at the data and there was a no trend at all, nothing was changing, nothing was changing, sort of like that first graph that we just looked at on the left, uh, then yeah, you might be able to pretty confidently say, you know what? I'm willing to believe uh, that things would have stayed the same uh, on average if nothing had happened. And so I'm willing to compare the outcome that I did see against a baseline of no change. And I'm pretty confident uh, that that would give me a causal effect. Now that's one approach. Now granted, of course, that's not going to work in all scenarios, although nice and lucky for you if you think you can justify that it works in yours. The second approach that we can take is to predict our after treatment data using the before treatment data, using something like a time trend. Now this is exactly what you saw on the graphs that I just showed you. We saw a trend in the data uh, either a flat trend or an upward sloping trend. And we just assumed that that trend would continue. So we see an upward sloping trend. We say, ah, here's the treatment effect. I'm just gonna assume that things would have continued on in the same direction. So whatever we are re actually see relative to that trend, that is going to be our positive or negative treatment effect. Now, the ways of predicting this trend uh, can be any way that you can predict a trend. There's a lot of different ways to predict a trend. You could use linear regression. You could use some sort of advanced time series modeling. Uh, but whatever it is, you are in some way predicting the continuation of a trend that you've seen in the pre-treatment data, and you're comparing to that trend. So the value that you see is above or below what we would have expected based on the trend beforehand continuing afterwards. 
as you might expect, this method is going to work its best if we do think that there's a good reason to believe that whatever trends we saw beforehand would have continued. The last general approach that we can take to making this prediction is to use after treatment data to predict the after treatment outcome. Well, wait a minute, how is that prediction? We're actually seeing the after treatment data. Well, we are not using the outcome in order to make that prediction. We are using other values that we can observe to make that prediction. So for example, let's say in the pre-treatment data, we notice that our outcome variable of interest is very highly correlated with some other variable. So if they're very highly correlated, maybe they go up and maybe they go down, maybe they sort of zoom around in many different directions, but they are highly correlated with each other. Let's say that we're interested in the effect of some change, maybe a, a law that outlaws beer drinking on the price of beer. All right, um, and in the before period, we notice that the price of beer and the price of wine are, are maybe very different prices, but they're very interlocked. So when the price of beer goes up, the price of wine goes up. When the price of beer goes down, the price of wine goes down as well. So we think they're very highly correlated. Then this treatment occurs that just bans uh, the sale of beer, maybe in a particular context, maybe you can't have a beer garden anymore. And what do we see? Well, we see that wine keeps going on its merry way and beer maybe shifts, right? We would have expected, if the treatment had not occurred, that beer would have continued to track with the wine, right? But instead, we see that it deviates from the wine, and that's how we get our prediction. We predict that it would have continued to go up and down when wine went up and down, and if we saw that it did something different, then that's probably the effect of treatment. Uh, the most common application of this is in financial markets, uh, where we do something like, hey, you know, this one stock that we're interested in seems to track the market as a whole pretty well, uh, and then right when the event occurs, it deviates from what the market as a whole is doing, and that is our treatment effect. And I'll talk more about this when I talk about applying event studies in finance. All right, that's the general idea of what an event study is, some terminology about it, and some different ways that we can approach the question of how can I predict what things would have been uh, in the absence of the treatment, that I, and therefore I can compare the actual outcome to that prediction. Thank you. <laughs>